Hello and welcome to this Analyst Angle. I'm Rob Stretchy, Managing Director with the Cube Research. Recently I attended HashiCorp's HashiConf, actually here in Boston. It was really a very interesting deep dive into where Hashi has been since the acquisition by IBM has been announced, some of the products and the product evolution, as well as some of their go-to-market and where they're trying to get to. On the evolving product strategy and announcements, they're really transitioning from tools to a managed services on a common platform. Announcements included updates to Terraform and Vault as managed services. This is really emphasizing the services that are consumption-based and in a SaaS format. New features such as HC, HCP Vault Secrets, Auto Rotation, and dynamic secrets management simplify credentials management and increase operational security for enterprise customers. A really big win and something that had been asked for and is really, as a person who's done this uh, at different companies, is really tough to do. They're also talked about the fact that they're targeting larger enterprises with high infrastructure spend. This makes a lot of sense that they're focusing on infrastructure spenders that are the global 3,500-ish, you know, a little bit more than the global 2,000, and with specialized services and advanced features. This kind of fits the IBM acquisition mantra and accounts where IBM has traditionally been strong. One of the things, as we dive into some of the ETR data to kind of bring this to life, we wanted to look at how Hashi was doing. Overall, their net score is actually down, which is not surprising when you start to focus on these larger accounts. And we've seen this with people such as VMware Broadcom and how their focus on those accounts has really brought them down. But in this slide, what I'm showing you here is a shot of the, you know, snapshot of the global 2000 and how they're really focusing in on that. And what you can see is in two of the core places with security and infrastructure management, they're actually up over where they had been and they're holding serve in other categories. So what we're seeing here is that actually you can see the transition that they're making in their go to market actually play out in this ETR slide. Now kind of digging into the announcements, they included ILM or Infrastructure Lifecycle Management and Security Lifecycle Management or SLM, different announcements around that. The ILM enhancements focused on ensuring cost control, security, and operational efficiency by centralizing functions across various infrastructure components. The Infrastructure Lifecycle Management updates included HCP Packer enhancements for image management. Packer now tracks pipeline metadata for image creation, enhanced visibility and compliance across infrastructure components. This enables better security by ensuring images used are consistently compliant, including tracking the CI CD information and ECS commits. Stacks and orchestration in Terraform was kind of the next place. Stacks or Terraform Stacks is now in public beta. It simplifies complex multi-environment infrastructure management by providing a single configuration point for provisioning across dev, prod, and staging environments. The key features were deferred changes, reducing configuration time by automating adjustments to based on infrastructure policy. Again, one of these things is, hey, you go in and maybe I can't do the whole thing, the whole change. What it will do is actually then defer some of the changes and pop them up for a admin to take a look at or a dev for that matter. Then orchestration rules, which was automating repetitive tasks, particularly beneficial for Kubernetes use cases, enabling easier and faster deployments with fewer manual steps. Then we jumped into some of the self-managed to manage migration tools that they're out there, which makes a lot of sense because as they talked about, they're out up to about 16% of their customer base using the HCP platform, which is their SaaS delivered. 
So they have Terraform Migrate, which is in public beta, which helps organizations seamlessly transition from community to enterprise or cloud versions by automating workspace setup, state migration, and policy association. So again, making it easier to move between the various different policies and locations. So if you wanted to go to the SaaS, this is a tool that makes a lot of sense. Now it's likely to be also used as a sales tool to help organizations that may have started on that community edition. So it makes a lot of sense there. We'll get to see a little bit more as we dive into this at KubeCon, CloudNativeCon in the coming weeks, as we see things such as open tofu that are out there that are kind of going in a little bit of a different direction, but we'll dig into that in a couple weeks. The next set of enhancements they had were really in the security lifecycle management. The first one, which actually is really pretty uh, you know, outstanding, is the Vault Radar for Secret Scanning. So HCP Vault Radar, so again, in the cloud version, in public beta, now includes tools for scanning and identifying leaked or hard-coded secrets across repositories, which is a huge, huge advancement. The new feature includes the radar agent, which scans on-premise repositories while centralizing management in HCP cloud delivered. Pre-received scanning also prevents scan secrets from being committed by flagging sensitive data before it's pushed, ensuring security during development. Then they also had advancements with HCP vault secret Auto-rotation and dynamic secrets. Auto-rotation for AWS, GCP, MongoDB, and Twilio integrations with more support plan allowing customers to rotate secrets on a schedule. This is really important. So when you start to look at how secrets management is done and what people want to do, they really want to do it across their entire infrastructure with a set policy. So they want to go set it and forget it, kind of that Ronco type example where I set it once and it happens so I don't have to think about it. This is really hard and getting to this point helps people get away from the significant amount of hard-coded secrets that are out there. Another one that they really talked about was dynamic secrets, enabling credential generation on demand integrated directly with Terraform for automatic retrieval, offering secure ephemeral access to infrastructure, which again, gets you away from those hard coding secrets and or even using secrets that you have to cut and paste in and then continually rotate as you change them in your vault. Another one that they talked about was boundary transparent sessions. This one was pretty interesting as well with a major upgrade to Boundary, allowing developers to access infrastructure seamlessly without additional steps if they're authorized. This reduces security risk by ensuring users only access what they're authorized to without disrupting workflows. Again, a lot of this was around how do you really enhance the life cycle of cloud native applications, which is going to be a huge topic as well at KubeCon and cloud native con as people look to how do they secure their AI infrastructure, which is being built out regularly now on Kubernetes. They also talked about enhancements to customer enablement and best practices. By standardizing reference architectures and maturity models, HashiCorp has released validated designs and maturity models to provide customers with best practices and operational guidelines for deploying, maintaining, and scaling their infrastructure, which has been one of those things that people have looked at on premise. So if you can think about the fact that maybe you're not ready to go to the HCP in the cloud platform, and given that it's 84% are still on prem, being able to scale this infrastructure and be able to maintain it becomes extremely important for them to maintain serve with those customers. They also highlighted some case studies and some success where HashiCorp solutions facilitated infrastructure scaling and improved operational efficiencies, including Wayfair, SAP, and large US healthcare insurance companies as well. ILM is a core for 
the organizational structure and workflow transformation that HashiCorp is pushing within their organization. So if you start to think about how they're changing their sales motion, you also have to understand that uh, there's not everybody in the organizations are going to be users of the HashiCorp set of tooling. So a lot of them and those organizations are having changes. Some things are moving from the CISO organization into some organizations such as platform engineering, SRE, or even DevOps. So this was a really an interesting change with an emphasis on platform engineering and new updates like ephemeral workspaces allowing teams to auto-destroy unused resources directly impacting costs and resource management. So again, helping people get involved in the Hashi Corp, Hashi Conf, and HCP and or the platforms on premise resources without having extreme expenses. This is because people coming up to speed may actually go and use something for a particular piece of time, but forget to destroy those resources. So this is a really huge investment in helping organizations such as platform engineering get a better hold on costs. It's not quite to the FinOps level, but it helps in a FinOps model where you're looking to control these costs. Announcements also included setting organization-wide policies, policy as code, and enhancements in module lifecycle management to reduce redundant configuration and streamline policy adherence. Again, this is getting to being able to operate Hashi easier, make it a lot easier to do that. They also talked about expanding managed service capabilities to support enterprise use cases. For instance, compliance and data sovereignty for regulated industries. These new capabilities for highly regulated industries, including CMP v2 protocol for PKI in telecom sector and IPv6 support for federal customers, broaden HashiCorp's offerings for compliance sensitive industries. Data locality requirements met by HCP Vault for European customers underscores HashiCorp's commitment to security and compliance in international markets. This has been a huge piece of what's been going on as you have uh, PII or you have other credentials and you don't want this to leak out and you have regulations such as DORA uh, which started in France but has gone throughout the EU for the financial services community that you need to be up and running and they want you to be able to get up and running within another cloud or on premise in a certain amount of time and having that stuff local to the region uh, definitely is a huge part of that as well. We did get a little bit of an update as well on the IBM partnership and really the future synergies that are perceived. So again, you're no, they're not yet uh, fully acquired or acquired by IBM. Uh, there is hopes that there's potential that this may happen before the end of the year. We'll see. Uh, you know, again, any time that these acquisitions happen, uh, things can pop up. But you know, it sounds very positive in that it's moving forward. They're, le they're looking to leverage the IBM's resources in particular for our R&D acceleration. I think this was stated as part of uh, the acquisition and that you know, HashiCorp really plans to double down on engineering and go-to-market support through its IBM partnership and enhanced product development and scalability with those added resources. They'll get uh, scale, you know, scale, you know, cost savings out of things like marketing and sales and com combination of that, but really be able then to focus from a divisional of IBM potentially as focusing on the product and on HCP as the platform. We think that there's notable collaborations, including potential integration with uh, IBM's FinOps suite and tools of suite for cost visibility. This includes uh, the recent acquisition of KubeCost, the Aptio set, and Turbonomic set of tooling. We could see that being uh, really a good, viable uh, set of collaborations and optimization as part of HashiCorp's growing focus on cloud management, which we were just talking about, which they're not really going and doing themselves. 
One of the things that we also find that will probably, that was not talked about, but will probably be a good announcement when they can fully be integrated after the acquisition is done is in the AI space. Uh, there was a lot of absence of AI talk, but if you start to look at how other companies such as Red Hat, which is owned by IBM, have been able to leverage Watson X for things like Ansible Lightspeed. That is kind of the path we expect Hashi to go down is kind of the Lightspeed-esque version of AI that they can bring to all of the HashiCorp tooling. This makes a lot of sense that they're not trying to reinvent the wheel uh, with potential acquisition and hopefully it closes and they can get to this and get to those abilities and capabilities for their customers to help bring things together. Other things that we thought were very interesting was the fact that there was a number of customers there that were willing to talk about how they were really focused in on different pieces of HashiCorp's stack. And I think one of the things that we find very interesting in this is that companies are using a lot of different tooling out there. And what they've found is that most companies are multi-cloud, multi-Kubernetes, and having something in the infrastructure as code space is still extremely important to them. It'll be very interesting to see how this all plays out in the coming weeks as we run into KubeCon, CloudNativeCon, and as the, the acquisition gets closed out. I wanna thank you for joining me on this Analyst Angle where we broke down HashiCorp's HashiConf. Stay tuned for more from us here at theCUBE the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.